carry them to church. But this is the original manuscript in transcript. Uh, the LDS Church owns most of what remains. Of the 28% that remains, 25% is in the church archives. The University of Utah has half a leaf. Uh, the other half of that's missing somewhere. There's probably four other, or two other leaves that could be around. Uh, Mark Hoffman produced some of the missing parts for us. <laughs> and so we have to eliminate those. There's the Wilford Wood family. And um, Wilford Wood, maybe you noticed in the Nauvoo Temple dedication, um, his, her, his daughter, Sister Cannon, was there. She's about 90, I think. But uh, Wilford Wood was a collector, and he would go back east about six times a year. He, well, he was supposed to be a furrier, but he used his fur business to make money to do collections of Mormonabilia. And um, he actually bought properties on his own and sometimes for the church in private and including the uh, Nauvoo Temple site. And that's why Sister Cannon was there at the temple dedication. President Hinckley referred to her. Well, um, Wilford Wood found some fragments. Um, when Emma's second husband, Major Bitterman, took out the manuscript from the cornerstone in 1882, he found this mess, most of it gone, eaten up with the mold. But he, say, he gave out the larger sheets to LDS people, mostly Franklin Richards, one of the members of the Twelve, and these things have ended up in the church archives. But there was a small bundle of fragments that the family had kept, and uh, Wilfred Wood tracked down the son of uh, Major Biderman and uh, bought a little bundle and cellophane, well, uh, later Wilford put them in a cellophane container. Um, there is a history of uh, the conservation of those fragments. It's about 2% of the text. I brought a few of these. This is a report from last summer called Uncovering the Original Text of the Book of Mormon. There you can see one of the fragments. This is from the last part of Helaman. Um, and there's what it looks like if you see it with ultraviolet light. You can read the thing. Can't read much with the water damage to these fragments. About 2% of the text is owned by the Wilford Wood family. And it was all in a little bundle. So we have our own sort of Dead Sea Scrolls that were in a safe in a museum near the great American Dead Sea. And they look like Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so you can, this is what the transcript looks like. It's, the importance of this is that for the first time it is generally available for reading what's actually on all of these pieces. So that people can study it. It's really for scholars. It's highly, is a, is a threshold to reading it. Um, makes it not so easy sometimes. Uh, at the same time, in 2001, we published in two parts the printer's manuscript, same kind of transcript. This, of course, is basically intact, 99.97% or something like that. So it's basically there. Uh, but it is a copy. And the problem with copies is that scribes make errors. Oliver, his error rate was about three word changes per manuscript page. Now that's actually good copy work. I found when I did transcripts myself, I made about three errors per page. So I think I was doing okay. So Oliver must have been doing okay. Uh, but in any event, um, <coughs> Those transcripts are available and um, therefore really for scholars. This is a more uh, easy account. Well, let's see, I'll put up. Um, so thus far in the critical text, we have published these two, the original manuscript. It's 
called a typographical facsimile. There are photographs of a lot of the fragments, and the church permitted about eight of the pages which they have to be photographed. Someday, hopefully, the whole thing will be available photographically. Uh, and there's the second volume as well. On the next one, I do, uh, hand out, I just describe briefly the other things that we're going to be doing. Um, volume three will be a history of the text of the Book of Mormon going from what we can tell about the translation process from the original manuscript and all the copying processes and the editing through the various editions, describing each edition and uh, what kinds of textual changes occur. Uh, volume four is analysis of textual variants. This is really the key volume to the, the critical text project where we go through the whole Book of Mormon looking at each verse and trying to determine what the evidence suggests would be what Joseph Smith actually received. We'll talk about some of these here in a minute. And fifth of all, there will be a complete electronic collation, a CD or something like that that you can use on your computer and you can look up any phrase and see how it's been and how it's changed and so forth. Um, okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about the purposes of a critical text. There are a number of important findings. One is to actually study the original language. There are some things in the original language which are quite unexpected. It isn't just in upstate New York English, and it just isn't in biblical English, sort of the King James style, thou doest this, and so forth. There's some more interesting things. I'm going to mention some here in a minute. A second purpose that, that I discovered by accident, really, was that the original manuscript provides very valuable information about how Joseph Smith translated. And we're going to look at this issue here in a moment. And the third one, of course, is to find corrections for the text, better readings, ones that make better sense. And I might point out here that I have probably had about 20 changes made because people have been writing to me, just normal people reading their Book of Mormon and saying, hey, this seems funny. And sometimes people have been able to suggest, I think, the correct answer. Other times they just say, this is funny, would you look at this? And it is rather amazing in many instances to find that perhaps there has been an error. Well, let's look at a few of these. The first one has to do with the original language. The original text of the Book of Mormon has in it Hebrew-like expressions, which are so bad as English that they have now been removed. In fact, they were basically removed from the second edition when Joseph Smith did the editing for the second edition. Uh, and so let's look at the next um, sort of handout or the overhead. Oh, well, okay, this is something else. Let me just explain this. A lot of people get upset that there are changes. Uh, the vast majority of the ones which textual people like me say, oh, yeah, this is significant, are things like dropping out the letter A or the word a. Uh. And actually, these are, I think, eight changes in the text. They're all accidental. They were done in different editions. When you translate the Book of Mormon, if the language you're translating into doesn't have a, uh, doesn't make any difference. And so a lot of languages don't even have the word a. Uh. But these are examples. The original text likes to repeat the a, uh, a strong and a mighty man. But this isn't the way we say it in English. We tend to throw out that repeated, uh, we say, a strong and mighty man. And the tendency over the time has been to accidentally just drop out the second A. So a strong and a mighty man in Omni 1852, the uh got dropped out. Just an accidental little error. A large and a wealthy people, 1840, 
It got dropped out. Now, you know, the, the tanners are up in Salt Lake. They're counting these things for us. This is really exciting. Uh, but, you know, they have this theory that the text has been transmitted perfectly, or it should be. And since it isn't, this proves God isn't behind it. The evidence I have found is that what Joseph Smith received through the instruments was indeed correct. The angel Moroni, or the Lord told the three witnesses that the translation was correct. And the evidence suggests over and over that once Joseph Smith saw what the Lord was giving him, he had to read it off correctly. The scribe had to hear it correctly. The scribe had to write it correctly. They had to copy it correctly. The printer had to typeset it correctly. And subsequent editors and typesetters have had to transmit it correctly. But all those later stages involve human beings who can make mistakes if they get tired. The Lord hasn't, as far as I can tell, intervened at that level. But I can also say that everybody, as far as I can tell, has always tried to transmit it as best possible. And when errors have been discovered, tried to correct them. Uh, the, on the other hand, it does suggest that what the Lord gave Joseph Smith was, in some really spectacular, revelatory way, correct. Um, well, uh, so here you have, these are what I can, these are the majority of kinds of examples you have. And they're not something, in, you know, overwhelmingly significant. Uh, but here is one that is interesting. This is a Hebraistic-like expression that's in the original text of the Book of Mormon. It's in the 1830 edition. I have a facsimile edition. This is the famous verse. And we don't quote it the way it originally was in the text. It originally reads, and if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, and he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now that and, you might they all, okay, the scribe just goofed. You know, just made an extra and. In Hebrew, however, when you express something like an if-then statement, you don't say, if you come, then I will come. You say, if you come, and I will come. That's the way they say it. We have something like that in English with something like, come home late, and you'll be grounded. <laughs> if you come home late, then you will be grounded. But we have it with a command form. We don't have it like this. This is not English. Now, you might say this is an accident, but there's one in Helaman that shows this was intended. And there are other examples, but let's look at the ones here in Helaman. This is the way the text originally read in the manuscripts. It also reads this way in the 1830 edition. And, yea, and if he saith unto the earth, move, and it is moved. Yea, if he say unto the earth, thou shalt go back, that it lengthen out the day for many hours, and it is done. And it goes on, verse after verse, doing this, if this and this. This is not an accident. Now, some people have a theory of Joseph Smith's translation that he got ideas. And that he had to put it into his own language. That's how people explain the bad grammar. See, God didn't do it. Joseph Smith did it. The problem with that theory is, if Joseph Smith got ideas, why is he sticking in all these ands? Which he never had in his own speech. We've never found any dialect of English in the whole history of it that has this kind of thing. It's a kind of literal Hebraism, Hebrew-like construction that's in the original text. And it has been, of course, removed. In 1837, Joseph Smith felt this just might get in the way of people understanding. And yes, that's correct. So they were removed from the edited standard text. Um, well, there's about 14 of these, but there are some other ones too. 
I'll, I'll talk more. We can ask these later. No, yeah, just the N. Just removing the N. There are three theories of control or translation control about what Joseph Smith did. One is what I call loose control. Joseph Smith just gives the, gets the ideas and it's his job to put it into his own English. Uh, this has been the standard sort of theory for many years, based basically on the idea the grammar can't come from God, the bad grammar. The second one is one that I've been arguing for. It's called tight control. That the Lord gave, first of all, Joseph Smith it word for word. Joseph Smith saw the ands, and he transmitted them faithfully to the scribe. But it was the responsibility of the scribe and Joseph Smith to make sure that they were transmitted and in copying and so forth. So it's tight control depending upon, you're trying to get it down word for word, but you can make mistakes. The third one is the ironclad control approach. And many witnesses of the Book of Mormon thought or believed that it was ironclad, that if there was no mistake, it could only go on if there was no mistake. Even David Whitmer thought they couldn't even misspell a common word. Well, if you read the original manuscript, you'll discover this can't be true. I mean, Oliver misspells. We know he was a school teacher, but it isn't standard spelling. The 1830 printer was a much better speller than, uh, than Oliver. And the other scribes. There are misspellings. The, the people that watched it made, a in, made an incorrect conclusion. However, they did observe Joseph Smith spelling out Book of Mormon names. In fact, some of them specifically say, and he would spell out the, the strange names. And there's very good evidence actually in the manuscripts that the scribe would first write something down phonetically. He heard it. Oliver would write down what he heard, what he thought it should be spelled like, and then you say, well, wait a minute, I don't know how to spell this. Now think about Nephi, you know, most of us are going to put an F in there, not a PH probably. But there are better examples from the actual manuscript. The first one here is Zenik. This is what Oliver actually wrote, for it is not written that Zenus alone spake of these things, but Zenik. And he first wrote with C.K., Zenik. This is how we would sort of expect to spell it. And then he crosses it out and on the same line, which means they must have stopped and said, wait a minute, how do you spell this? Spelled C.H. Now, if you look in your current Book of Mormon, it's C.K. But no name in the Bible is, has a C.K. at the end or in the Book of Mormon. And in fact, Zenik is spelled like Enik. It ends in a CH. But Oliver had a problem. And when he copied every Zenik into the printer's manuscript, he misspelled every one of them. <laughs> he put them all back as CKs. And your current text has CK. Now, you know, this doesn't prevent you from understanding the message of the book. But it's really interesting that the original is CH. The manuscript, the original, suggests that Joseph Smith, they stopped and it was spelled out. The last one, the second one here, is really convincing to me. Coriantumer. Oliver first spells it T-U-M-M-E-R at the end. You know, that's pretty good spelling. But then it's all crossed out and Oliver writes it with the correct ending, T-U-M-R. You can't spell this unless somebody spells it out letter for letter. Even if Joseph had said Coriantumur, you're still stuck with a vowel. We'd all put a vowel in there somewhere. In fact, when Oliver wrote the T-U-M-R, this is how he wrote it, he, put the, he goes M and R, and he puts a huge swirl on the R. It was like he was writing, how can you expect me to spell this? <laughs> you know, this R, just, and he never does it anywhere else. It is, this, you couldn't do it. And this is pretty good evidence that Joseph Smith could see the spellings of the names. 
And this would lead then the people watching it to say, yeah, they could control down to the spelling of the words. But it wasn't ironclad. Occasionally, errors uh, do occur. Um, one final bit of evidence that, uh, that I think the words were actually given word for word comes from the next one. Um, this is one that Jack Welch has pointed out. Um, the language of the Book of Mormon is sometimes repeated word for word, long passages, completely unrelated, and it's not biblical quotes. And here is one in 1 Nephi 1 and 8, and it says, And he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Later on, in Alma 36, Alma is telling Helaman about his conversion, and he remembers seeing the throne of God, and he thinks of this same vision that Lehi had, and he says, And methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels, in the attitude of singing and praising their God. This is word for word the same. Now, if Joseph Smith is just getting the ideas and putting his own language, he's doing a really good job of remembering what he did before. My opinion is that he was being given these actual words in the translation process. Um, now, one of the interesting things we have discovered in the history of this project is that the original text is very consistent. There are many examples where little errors have created minor exceptions. And the first one here we have is, your current text reads according to what the printer's manuscript says. This is for 1 Nephi 12. And a great and a terrible gulf divideth them, yea, even the word of the justice of the eternal God. However, the printer's man or the original manuscript doesn't read word, but reads sword. It was very difficult for Oliver to read sword because the scribe was a what I call one of the bad scribes. He wrote his S's like they were an undotted I. And so Oliver saw a W there that had four strokes, and he thought it was word. In fact, I thought it was word. But eventually I realized that scribe never made four-stroke W's. And so having realized that, I said, oh, that's the word sword. But what's really interesting is that when we look elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, it only refers to the sword of God's justice. It never talks about the word of God's justice. Now, the word of God's justice will work in the sense that his justice will probably be judgment and involve his word. So. It isn't a problem in sense of understanding the text. But the original has sword. And notice down in Ether 8, I'll read it off since some of you can't see it, the sword of the justice of the eternal God. In Ether, it has exactly the same expression as it did originally in 1 Nephi 12. Notice, though, the original text is 100% consistent on this. And this is the really surprising finding of the Critical Text Project. And in this particular uh, pa uh, book, you can read in the end, I give about 15 different examples where the original text was perfect, but the current text by accidental errors have one or two little what I call wrinkles in the text. They don't interfere with understanding the, the, the text of the Book of Mormon. They don't interfere with testimony. But it is, to me, really an amazing thing to see how consistently that translation was produced for Joseph Smith. Uh, the next example is one that shows the original manuscript does have errors in it. It reads in 1 Nephi 7, the Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael and also his whole whole. That's what it reads. It can't be right. It is an error. 
Notice, however, the printer's manuscript, all of her copying it, didn't like whole, whole. So he had to do something, and he wrote, the Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael and also his household. What I think the whole, whole stands for is ultimately his whole household. There's an example in Alma 22. And the scribe heard his whole household and heard two holes and really messed it up and ended up with that error. Elsewhere in the text of the Book of Mormon, when you have some man, it's always a man, and his household, it's always his whole household or all of his household. They all go along. It's unlike modern families where kids don't obey. But they all obeyed in those days. And so in the Book of Mormon, it's always everybody goes along, except in the original here in 1 Nephi about Ishmael. The whole whole suggests to me it should be probably his whole household. And that explains then why the whole got repeated by the scribe. Well, let me give you one example that I think is interesting. It has to do with Elder Wells' discussion of the word retain. And I don't think I, I, don't think I have any for this one, so we can turn this off. Um, in your current text, when you read Alma 39, it says, ta Alma's talking to his wayward son, the bad missionary, and he's supposed to go back, and he says to him, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and that wrong which ye have done. That's the way your current text reads. So he's supposed to go back, and he's supposed to acknowledge his faults and the wrong which he has done. It's a little redundant, but that's what it says. That, ch th that text is read that way since 1920. In earlier editions, in fact, from the printer's manuscript on, this is what it reads, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and retain that wrong which ye have done. Retain. Take back or keep. Maybe you could think of sin as, you know, it got out there somewhere and you got to get it back. So you get it back, retain it. The Book of Mormon uses the word retain to mean to take back very often. Zarahemna takes back his sword. He retains his sword. He, doesn't, he gave it up to Moroni, but he takes it back and the word is retained. So maybe you could do this. Well, when we look at the original manuscript, the word retain looks like it's there. But the T, what seems to be a T, has a big crossing, heavy ink crossing. And when I was looking at this, I suddenly realized all over that page there were all these blots of ink. When Oliver had gotten done, he spilled some of his ink. They had quills, you know, a bottle. It went everywhere. And one of those went right on top of a letter and made it look like a crossed T. When you sort of take that away from it, I realized it was a P. And at the end of the word, instead of it being an N, it looks sort of like an N, it was an R. And the word is repair. The original manuscript reads, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong which ye have done. Then I looked up in the Book of Mormon other places, and there are lots of other places which talk about people that are told to go back and repair the wrongs. Now what I like about this one is it emphasizes that repentance is not just going and saying, I'm sorry. Just not acknowledging, it's also we have to repair the damage. Now, the other passages show that very clearly. But this one, when we see what the original text was, we can say, yes, that's exactly what it should read. And so we find a few examples like this where the original text tells us something about the gospel. It's there elsewhere in the text as well. It's not anything really new. But I found it to be very strengthening to have an understanding that perhaps the Lord did actually give this text to Joseph Smith that he saw it actually word for word. B.H. Roberts thought it was too easy, just read it off. But I would submit not many people 
are doing that, getting a revealed text, literally word for word from the Lord. The Lord said this was a marvelous work and a wonder. And I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon that actually predates all the work which I've done on the critical text. My testimony does not depend upon the work I've done. Uh, over 25 years ago in reading the book, I came to this one place in reading about the queen of King Lamoni. And when Abish goes and takes her hand and she comes up out of her trance and she claps her hand. Your current text says clasp, but she claps her hands. It's very Pentecostal. And she rejoices. She's seen her Savior. As I was reading this, I had a witness from the Spirit that the Lord, that this really happened. Not the Book of Mormon is true. This really happened. And I'm grateful for that testimony long before I ever worked on this text. This is a book for our times, and I recommend it to you. It has messages for us, and I'm um, grateful that I could come today here and talk to you about that. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Well, I left you no, I, I left you one minute for questions. Not very good, but <laughs> I guess we'll do a couple here. I got, maybe there's no time. <laughs> I know uh, some people have inferred from this that the studying out meant that it was the ideas, but I believe that there had to be some more serious concentration to actually start getting the words. I don't think it came by the ideas, but um, uh, there were many incidents where Joseph Smith wasn't in the right spirit or even had once all, uh, Martin Harris switched uh, put the wrong interpreter in, couldn't work. Uh, there are aspects to it that means that it was more than just sort of thinking hard. Uh, a lot of people have interpreted that Doctrine and Covenants one that way, but I think it was more than just that. Well, I better quit because actually we have to have some, isn't it four o'clock when the next one's done? Yeah, I'm quitting, but you can talk with me. I'm <laughs> Except I want to hear Don Perry, so you have to get me at 6 o'clock. <laughs>